Welcome to the History of English podcast, a podcast about the history of the English language. This is episode 98, The Great Debates. In this episode, we're going to look at the aftermath of Magna Carta. Rather than settling the dispute between the king and his barons, it actually sparked a renewed debate over the power of the king. And that wasn't the only debate that was taking place during this period. The art of debating was being taught in schools and universities. The burgeoning legal profession used those techniques to try cases in the newly reformed court system. And poets composed poetry in a popular style that featured characters engaged in a debate about various topics. So this time, we'll look at the art of debate in 13th century England. But before we begin, let me remind you that the website for the podcast is historyofenglishpodcast.com, and you can sign up to support the podcast at patreon.com slash historyofenglish. And as always, you can reach me by email at kevin at historyofenglishpodcast.com. Now this time, I want to look at what happened in the immediate aftermath of Magna Carta. And I had planned to take the story beyond the death of King John, but I won't have time to get there this time because there's an important Middle English poem that I want to discuss. The poem is called The Owl and the Nightingale. And while the date of the poem is unclear, many scholars think it was composed during John's reign. It's an important text in the overall history of English, because it's one of the earliest pieces of English poetry to be composed after the Norman Conquest. There were a few other poems, like Leoman's Brute, but most of those other poems were translations or interpretations of earlier Latin or French texts. The Owl and the Nightingale was different, though, because it appears to have been composed in English, and it's not based on an earlier poem in another language. Now, even though it appears to be a native poem, it does rely on certain literary styles that were very popular in Latin and French. For one thing, it's a rhyming poem, which was common on the continent, but was still pretty rare for poems written in English. English tended to use alliteration, and even a poem like Brute mixed alliteration and rhyming. But this particular poem uses a consistent rhyming scheme based on a style used in Latin and French poetry. The poem also uses another technique borrowed from Latin and French poetry, and that's the idea of a debate between two characters, in this case, two birds. This type of poetry is sometimes called debate poetry, and it was very popular on the continent during this period. And in fact, it had been popular there for about a century. But The Owl and the Nightingale is one of the first poems in this style to be composed in Middle English. Since one of the themes of this episode is the art of debate, let's take a closer look at that word, debate. The word was borrowed into English in the mid-1300s from French. It combines that standard Latin prefix d, spelled d-e, with the root word bait, which meant to strike or beat. We have that same root in some other words, words like battle and combat and battery as in assault and battery. All of those words came from Latin. The prefix D meant down, as in descend. So to debate was literally to beat down or to fight. In that sense, it could refer to a physical battle or confrontation. And that was the original meaning of the word when it entered English in the 1300s. It later came to mean a verbal dispute in which each side exchanges arguments to support their position. But originally, it had more of a sense of a physical confrontation. And we get a sense of that physical confrontation when we consider those other closely related words, battle, combat, and battery. Now, I said that all of those words came from a Latin root word that meant to strike or beat. But the history of that root word beyond Latin is unclear. Many scholars think that it was borrowed by the Romans from a Celtic word in Gaul, when Gaul was still a Roman territory. And the Celtic word appears to share the same Indo-European root as the Old English word beat. The Franks also had a version of that word, and that version passed into French as but, as in to butt heads, 
and it's also found in the words rebut and rebuttal, which is part of a debate. To rebut is literally to strike back, to return the blow. And in a formal debate, one side makes an argument, and the other side offers a rebuttal. So it appears that debate and rebut share the same root, meaning to strike or beat. Now, so far, we've seen the connections between debate, rebut, battle, combat, and battery, all of which came from Latin, but none of them are apparently native to Latin. They came from either Celtic or Germanic root words, so the Romans borrowed those roots from the people who lived on the fringes of the empire. And one of the reasons why scholars know that those words are not native to Latin is because the Indo-European root word began with a B sound, as in beat and battle, but that Indo-European B sound tended to shift to an F sound within Latin. We've seen that sound change before. English has the native word brother, where Latin gave us the word fraternal from a shared root. So if we're looking for a native Latin word from this same Indo-European root, we should expect to find a word with an F sound instead of a B sound. And that's exactly what we find in the word refute, which is a native Latin word. So rebut and refute are cognate. Rebut has the Germanic B sound and probably came into French from the Franks. And refute has the Latin F sound, and it came into French from the Romans. But they both have common Indo-European roots. So as we examine these words, we find that all of these words relate to some type of confrontation or fight. Some relate to physical violence, like beat and battle and combat and battery. Others are limited to verbal disputes, like debate and rebut and refute. And the relationship between those words shows that there's a fine line between a verbal confrontation and a physical confrontation. Sometimes, if the parties can't settle their argument with words, they resort to violence. And as I noted, a debate is literally a downbeat or a beatdown. And sometimes it can actually lead to a beatdown. And that's what happened in the debate over Magna Carta. The adoption of Magna Carta in 1215 did not end the debate between John and his barons. It actually sparked a new debate. The question that was raised after the charter was who had the final say in the political affairs of England? Was it still the king or was it now the barons? This debate raged for a while and without a resolution, it ultimately led to civil war. In order to understand this debate and what happened next, we have to look more closely at the document itself. And this actually takes us to a debate that continues to this day. Was Magna Carta a foundational document of Western democracy, or was it just a feudal charter designed to protect the interest of a bunch of wealthy barons? Again, this is still the subject of some debate. So let's take a quick look at each side of that argument. And let's start with those who take the latter view, that Magna Carta was the product of a specific time and place, and it actually has little relevance to us today. This view suggests that there's a myth of Magna Carta. The advocates of this view are quick to note that the Charter was largely forgotten within England in the centuries that followed. When Shakespeare composed his play about the life of King John in the late 1500s, he didn't even mention Magna Carta which seems odd in retrospect. Those who argue for this so-called myth of Magna Carta point out that it was ultimately a feudal document which addressed specific feudal concerns, and it had little practical effect after the feudal system began to disappear over the next couple of centuries. The document contained 63 separate clauses, but only three still remain in effect in English law. I should note that the clauses in the original document were not numbered, but later scholars decided to assign numbers to them for easier reference. The word clause is actually a French and Latin word, and it appears for the first time in English around the current point in our story in the early 1200s. 
It's related to the word close, which also appears for the first time around this point. And both of those words are also related to the word conclude. So when one thought concluded and a new idea began, that marked the shift from one clause to the next. The first clause of Magna Carta guaranteed the rights of the church, and that's one of the provisions that still remains in effect in English law. It is generally accepted that that provision was inserted at the beginning of the document thanks to the Archbishop Stephen Langton, who was the key figure in negotiating the document. Most of the next dozen or so provisions deal with the financial concerns of the barons that I discussed in the last episode. Those provisions imposed limits on feudal taxes, like scutage and aid and reliefs. Those were the taxes imposed on the barons that I discussed last time. So these specific fees and taxes were restricted. The Charter also has a specific provision dealing with a noble's debts. It says that a noble's lands won't be seized to pay a debt to a lord as long as the noble has other property to pay the debt. The seizing of land to pay a debt was called distraint in feudal law. And keep that idea in the back of your mind, because it's going to become very important in a moment. Also, let me digress for a moment and mention something about that word, debt. It's a Latin and French word, and it appears in English for the first time around this point in the early 1200s. And remember that words were spelled phonetically during this period. So the word debt did not have a B in it during the period of Middle English. It was usually spelled D-E-T-T-E. And we know from earlier episodes that double consonants, like double T's, were used to indicate that the preceding vowel was pronounced as a short vowel. So in this case, it meant that the letter E was pronounced as E instead of A. And that's the same vowel sound that we use today in the word debt. So all of that means that debt was pronounced the same way in Middle English that it's pronounced today. The spelling actually made sense at the time. But of course, today we spell that word with a B. D-E-B-T. So where did that B come from? Well, we can thank early modern English scholars for that. Many of them were fascinated by Latin and by the origin of English words. So they thought that English should clearly indicate when a word had been borrowed from Latin. In Latin, the word debt was debitum. And we actually have a more direct borrowing of that word in the word debit like a debit card. Well, these scholars thought that people should know that words like debt and debit were related. So in the 1500s, as English spelling started to become standardized and fixed, it was decided to insert a B in the word debt to indicate that the original Latin word had a B in it. So we ended up with the modern spelling with a silent B. Now the word debt first appears in a text that I'm going to look at after the next episode. It's called the Ancrenorila, or the Anchoress's Rule. That same text also contains the first use of the word sign, as in a stop sign. And sign is another word that has a silent letter in it as a Latin marker. Of course, it's the letter G. We don't really need that G in there. But compare the word sign with the word signal. Also, when you sign your name on a piece of paper, that's called your signature. All of those words are derived from the Latin root word signum. So there was a G in there in Latin. And when the word sign was borrowed into English around the current point in our story, it was sometimes spelled with a G and sometimes without a G. In fact, in that original text, it was rendered in its plural form as signs, spelled S-I-N-E-S. So that suggests that the G sound was already being dropped from the word by the time it entered English. But that G has been retained in modern spelling to indicate the ultimate origin of the word, and to show the connection to related words like signal and signature. So, if you ever co-sign for someone on a debt 
Now you know that sign and debt both came into English at the same time, and they both have silent consonant letters to reflect their Latin roots. And in feudal England, debts were often collected by seizing a debtor's lands. And if you co-signed or obligated yourself on someone else's debt, your land could also be taken. Now, King John had abused that privilege, again called distraint. He had forced a lot of vassals into debt and then seized their lands when they couldn't pay. So Magna Carta imposed limits on the king's ability to do that. Again, these were very specific provisions that related to feudal property law and they have no real application to the modern world. Also, last time, I talked about John's ability to force a baron's widow to remarry. He could effectively sell her and her property to the highest bidder. And he essentially did the same thing when young children inherited lands from their father. John would sell the guardianship to the highest bidder. Well, the early clauses of Magna Carta also restricted those abuses by John. So as we can see, most of these provisions were aimed squarely at John to deal with his financial abuses, and they were designed to benefit the barons specifically, not the general population of England. And most of these provisions had no real effect beyond the feudal age. Many of the other provisions were also aimed at specific issues of the time. One clause required the removal of fish traps from the Thames, Another provision called for the removal of eight named persons from the royal service. A provision required the return of certain Welsh hostages held by the king. And another clause required specific dealings with the then king of the Scots, named Alexander. The charter also called for the abolition of royal forest land that had been established during John's reign. So as we can see, a lot of these provisions are locked in a time and place that has long since passed. There's no mention of a parliament, and very few of the provisions extend to the common people of England. The document does contain a clause that gives a group of 25 barons the right to enforce the charter, but there's no mention of any kind of representative body beyond that, and certainly no mention of a popularly elected assembly. The document was not really intended as a permanent constitution. It was simply a peace treaty to confirm a truce between John and his barons. By the way, the word truce also appears for the first time around this point. So, for the critics of Magna Carta, any notion that the document was a cornerstone of modern democracy is a myth, a myth created by later statesmen whenever they had a grievance against the king and needed a legal argument to support their position. So that's one side of the debate. But what about the other side? What's the rebuttal? Well, those who revere the Charter point to its philosophical underpinnings. To them, the Charter represents the more basic and fundamental idea that the king himself was subject to the law. The Charter was based on the notion that there was no absolute or divine right of kings. Prior to this point, the monarch was above the law, able to impose laws on a whim. But now, the king acknowledged that he was bound by the law itself. So the charter established the idea that there was a higher set of laws which applied to everyone, including the king. And if the king violated those laws, he could be held to account for those violations. Clause 12 of Magna Carta dealt with the king's ability to assess feudal taxes, like scootage and aid. It provided that those taxes should not be imposed except by, quote, the common council of our kingdom, end quote. Now, the charter didn't specify exactly what that meant, but it clearly implied that the taxes were not to be imposed whenever the king felt like it. There was to be some type of common council. When later colonists in America argued that there should be no taxation without representation, they pointed to that clause in Magna Carta. Another more notable provision in the Charter was Clause 39. This is probably the most quoted part of the Charter, and it's used to point out how revolutionary the Charter was at the time. Here's what it says, quote, No free man shall be arrested, imprisoned, 
dispossessed of his goods, outlawed, exiled, or harmed in any way, except by the judgment of his peers, according to the law of the land. End quote. Now, many legal scholars point to this clause as an early statement of what we know today as due process of law. It's the idea that a person should not be arrested or imprisoned for no reason. Everyone is entitled to the judgment of his peers and according to the law of the land. Many later scholars have also argued that this clause established a basic right to a trial by jury, even though the wording is not that specific. The most important part is probably the final few words, the part where it says that judgment should be rendered, quote, according to the law of the land, end quote. Again, that phrase is not clearly defined, but it implies some vague set of legal principles to which everyone is bound. And it's certainly clear that whatever was meant by the law of the land, it was something other than the king's whim. It was something beyond the king's personal judgment. So, Magna Carta contains an early expression of the idea that the king or the government is bound by the law, and it can't just do whatever it pleases. These specific clauses may have been buried deep in the document, but they're in there, and they were acknowledged by both sides at the time. So, in a nutshell, those are the two sides of the debate concerning the legacy of Magna Carta. Either antiquated feudal charter or the foundational document of Western democracy. While that debate rages on, I want to focus on another debate, the debate that ensued immediately after the Charter was adopted. I said earlier that the Charter didn't really settle the debate between John and his barons. It actually sparked a new debate, and that debate concerned who was really in charge of the country after the Charter. The key to this particular debate centered around another clause that was added near the end of the document, known as Clause 61. This was the enforcement provision, the so-called Security Clause. It said that the barons would establish a committee of 25 barons who would oversee the enforcement of the Charter to make sure that John abided by the terms of the agreement. If anyone felt that the king was not complying with the Charter, they could bring their grievances to the committee. The committee of barons could then take action against the king. They could seize his castles and other properties until it was determined that he was in compliance. Now, you remember earlier when I mentioned that word, distraint? It was what happened when a vassal couldn't pay his debts. The lord could step in and seize his property. It was a basic part of feudal law. But it was only available to a lord to be used against a vassal who didn't comply with some condition. So it could be used by the king against his subjects. But here, it was being applied in reverse. Now, the same process could be used by the barons against the king. It was a remarkable provision, and it raised the issue of who was really in charge of the country at that point. From John's perspective, If a committee of barons could overrule his decisions and seize his properties, then they were the ones in charge of the country. He had been effectively dethroned. Rather than achieving a balance of power with the king, the barons had essentially seized the throne itself. In response, the barons argued that the charter was pointless if John could simply ignore it at will. There needed to be some type of enforcement mechanism. Without a clear way to arbitrate those disagreements, it was inevitable that more conflicts would occur. So this was the debate that erupted in the wake of Magna Carta. And without a resolution, it was destined to lead to war. The conflict was heightened when the barons filled that committee of barons with 25 of John's sworn enemies. Not surprisingly, the committee soon seized two of John's castles and gave them to a prominent noble who claimed them. Despite Magna Carta, the king and his barons were once again on a collision course. I noted earlier that the word debate came into English in the 1300s. So at the current point in our story, in the early 1200s, English tended to use a native Old English word to refer to a verbal dispute. They called it motien. It's related to the word moot, 
which refers to something that is endlessly debatable. Of course, a moot court is a mock court where students go to debate certain legal issues. The word motian is also related to the words meet and meeting. When a meeting was held, people tended to debate certain matters on the agenda. And you might remember that an Anglo-Saxon assembly was called a yamot from the same root. During the Anglo-Saxon period, the king's advisors were called the Witan, and when they assembled to debate political issues, it was called the Witaniyamot. Now, the old Anglo-Saxon Witan included prominent nobles and church officials, but the Witan didn't survive the Norman conquest, and Parliament was still a few decades away. So, at this point, in the early 1200s, there was no formal assembly where these issues could be debated and resolved. Without that institution, John and the barons tried to negotiate with each other as best they could, but to no avail. A charter had been executed, but it hadn't solved the fundamental problem of who had final say on political matters in England. The two sides planned a meeting at Oxford in July of 1215 to resolve some of these issues, but it accomplished nothing. The barons didn't even stand when John entered the room. A follow-up meeting was scheduled for the next month, but John didn't bother to attend. With no third party to resolve the dispute, the church played an important role. The church was in a position to help moderate the dispute, but even within the church there was an internal debate. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, had been very active in procuring the charter, and he was inclined to side with the barons. Meanwhile, the Bishop of Winchester, named Peter de Roche, had remained loyal to John. He was the only bishop who had remained in England during the interdict. That division within the English church meant that the Pope was destined to be the tiebreaker. And this is where John's mea culpa, a few years earlier, really paid off. As we saw last time, John had completely given in to the Pope and even designated the Pope as the feudal overlord of England. And the Pope had rewarded that decision by lifting the interdict and revoking John's excommunication. The Pope actually became John's firm ally, and John probably knew that he could count on the Pope's support in this debate. Within days after the charter was signed, John wrote to the Pope in secret and asked him to declare the charter null and void. While John awaited the response, he prepared for war, and so did the barons. In late August, the Pope rendered his verdict, and not surprisingly, he sided with John. He declared Magna Carta null and void. He declared that the charter was invalid because John had been forced to sign it. And furthermore, the Pope himself was now the overlord of England, so no such charter could be valid without the Pope's consent, which had not been given. Pope Innocent directed the barons to recognize John as the supreme political authority in England. The Pope even went one step further. He suspended Stephen Langton as archbishop for siding with the barons. In many respects, this was the final straw. With papal support, John formally withdrew his consent to the charter. He marshaled his forces, and he moved against the barons the country entered another period of open civil war. Once again, a debate had led to a battle. At the end of 1215, Magna Carta was deemed a failure. It was ultimately a peace treaty, but the country was once again at war. This was a dispute that would continue until John's death, which was actually just around the corner. A bout of dysentery would soon bring an end to John and ultimately bring an end to this dispute. I'll look at those events next time, but for now, I want to look at that word, dispute, because it was another brand new word in the language at this point. Like the word debate, it was borrowed from Latin and French. And also, like the word debate, the word dispute was derived from an Indo-European root word that meant to strike or hit. It also meant to cut. The same root word that gave us the word dispute also gave us the word amputate. The word dispute 
found its way into English around the current point in our story. And it appeared for the first time in that poem I mentioned earlier, The Owl and the Nightingale. So with that, let's turn our attention to that poem. I think it's important to begin by putting this poem into some overall context. In many ways, it was the product of many of the themes that we've explored over the past few episodes. It reflects the rebirth of English literature that took place in the early 1200s. And the fact that the poem is structured as a long debate reflects the important role of the debate format at the time. The debate format was very popular in Latin and French literature, and that type of literature was probably influenced by the growth of education during this period, which later scholars called the 12th century Renaissance. In many schools, and in many of those new universities, classes were taught using the Socratic method, which was really just a type of debate. A master would take a position and pose questions to his students, and the students would have to respond in a logical manner. And I noted that much of that education centered around rhetoric, the art of making logical arguments. So in that sense, a debate was really an extension of logic and rhetoric. A few episodes back, I also looked at the legal reforms instituted by John's father, Henry II. I noted how those legal reforms led to the rise of the legal profession. And those new lawyers were trained in those new universities. And with the rise of the government bureaucracy and record-keeping, which we looked at last time, that meant that court decisions started to be maintained as permanent records. So when a case came before a judge, the judge could now go back and see how similar disputes had been settled in the past. The judge could evaluate the legal arguments made by the competing parties and their lawyers and he could render a decision that was consistent with the judgment made in those earlier cases. That gave birth to the English common law, a body of law based on written legal precedents. And it ensured a more consistent form of justice. It allowed lawyers to make reliable legal arguments based on those earlier precedents. And with the rise of legalism, again, there was an interest in the art of debate the give and take of competing legal arguments. So we can start to see how many of these themes were interconnected. Universities, logic, rhetoric, record-keeping, legal reforms, they all fed into each other, and they all encouraged a respect and reverence for the art of debate. And that may help to explain why this style of debate poetry became so popular during this period. Up to this point, that type of poetry had been mostly confined to Latin and French. But around the current point in our story, we get this first major debate poem in Middle English. Now, I should make a quick note about the date of this poem. The date is actually unknown. The poem survives in two manuscripts that were written down in the second half of the 1200s. But those two surviving versions are copies made from an earlier original. The language of the poem is definitely early Middle English, not Old English, but it has very few French or other loan words, and it even retains some Old English inflectional endings that were largely gone by the end of the 1200s, so it has traditionally been dated to the early 1200s. The only clue within the text itself is a reference to a deceased King Henry. At one point in the poem, the nightingale tells a story about a knight who was jealous of any man who spoke to his wife. So he locked his wife in a room in his castle so no one could speak to her. The wife was sad, so the nightingale sang to her to keep her happy. The knight then became angry at the bird and tried to have the nightingale captured and killed. The bird says that King Henry discovered what the knight tried to do and deprived him of his property. In other words, Henry exercised the right of distraint against the knight. The specific reference to Henry reads as follows. The events were discovered by King Henry. May Jesus have mercy on his soul. In the original Middle English, the passage reads, That underiat the king Henry, Jesus his soul do mercy. So this passage implies that the poem was written 
after the death of a King Henry. Well, Henry I died in 1135, but the language and structure of the poem seems far too advanced to be that old. So it's generally been assumed that the Henry referenced in the poem was John's father, Henry II, who died in 1189. But John's son was also named Henry, and he became Henry III in 1216 when John died. And he reigned for a very long time, until he died in 1272. Now, some scholars think the reference is actually to John's son Henry, Henry III. But the general lack of French words and the use of Old English inflections suggest an earlier date. So most scholars tend to favor the view that the reference is to John's father, Henry II. Also, since John's son Henry became king in 1216, most scholars think that a reference to a King Henry would have been ambiguous after that date. Any reference to a Henry after 1216 might have been confusing to readers without some clear indication who the poet was referring to. So those scholars tend to favor the view that the poem was composed before John died and his son Henry became king. That would date the poem to the year 1216 or earlier. Again, the debate over the date will continue, but the Oxford English Dictionary follows this traditional line of thought, and it estimates the date of the poem as the year 1216 at the current point in our overall story. So I'm going to go with that date as well. But again, the exact date is uncertain. I should also note that the author of the poem is also unknown. The poem does make a reference to a person identified as Master Nicholas of Guildford. Guildford is a town south of London. In the poem, Nicholas is identified as the person who will ultimately judge the debate between the two birds. Some scholars think that Nicholas himself was the author. Others think that the author was a close friend of Nicholas and just included Nicholas's name in the poem. At any rate, nothing is really known about Nicholas, so we'll just leave the author as anonymous. Now, the poem begins with the following passage. As always, I'll give you a modern English translation first and then the original Middle English. So here are the first few lines. I was in a summer dale, in a very secluded hollow. I heard a great tale being held between an owl and a nightingale. It was in un summer dale, in un sultha dichla hala. I heard each hold a great tale, an ula and un nichtingala. You'll notice the rhyming verse, and also each line is based on a specific number of beats and syllables. Each line has four beats and eight syllables, so there's a rhythm to the poem. This structure was common in Latin and French poetry at the time, so the owl and the nightingale uses that same scheme. A few other quick notes about the vocabulary in that opening passage. We see the Old English word on, A-N, meaning one, rendered as O-N-E for one of the first times in English, maybe the very first time. A few episodes back, we saw the long ah sound was in the process of shifting to an ah sound during this period, on its way to the modern o sound. And I noted that the word on became on, and then later own, as in the word only, before finally evolving into the modern word one. And that initial sound change from on to on is indicated by a change in spelling. The A was replaced with an O in many of those words. So here we see Old English on, spelled A-N, now being spelled O-N-E, and probably being pronounced as on. The poet also says that the two birds were in a hala, which is literally a hole, but it meant a secluded place. And we can see in that passage how the words hole and hollow are connected. If something is hollow, it has a hole in it, or an empty cavity. So a secluded valley was sometimes described as a hole or a hollow place, and that produced the modern sense of the word hollow as a valley. 
Of course, some rural American dialects pronounce it as a holler. Lastly, the passage says that the two birds held a great tala, or tail. Remember that the word debate wasn't borrowed until the next century. So here, the poet used the native word tale, T-A-L-E. The original sense of the word was broader than the modern sense. It meant a discussion. In fact, the word tale is closely related to the word talk. So when the poet says that the birds held a tail, he meant that they were talking. The next few lines read, The pleading was stiff and stark and strong, sometimes soft and sometimes loud, and each against the other swelled and let out that evil mood completely. That plate was steep and stark and strong, soon we lay soft and lewd among, and either achen uther swall, and let that evil mood ut all. Now here the poet describes the debate as a plate or a pleading. This is a French term, and it's an early version of our modern words plea and plead. It shows a certain fascination with the legal process and legal debates. In fact, some scholars have argued that the entire poem is structured around the typical procedure used in a lawsuit at the time. For example, legal procedure required the trial to start with a plea. And here the poet says that pleas were made by both sides, stiff and stark and strong. The two birds swelled at each other and let out their evil mood or anger. We're then told that the nightingale began the speech in the corner of a breach or clearing and set upon a fair bow or branch surrounded by blossoms enough. The nightingale began the speech in on a urna of on a breche, and set upon vera boch, there were about blossom enoch. Now we're told that the nightingale sat upon a vera boch, a fair bow, or a fair branch. The word bow is a very old word for a branch or a limb. And notice that the poet described it as fair, but he spelled it with a V, not an F, so he pronounced it as there, not fair. He does this a lot in the poem, using a V for an F. And that's an indication that the poet was from the far south of England. It was common in Middle English for certain unvoiced consonants to be voiced in the far south of England. So F's were pronounced as V's, and S's were pronounced as Z's. Now, this feature still exists in the southwest of England, where you'll hear the region of Somerset pronounced as Zummerzet. I'll look a little more closely at this accent feature in future episodes. But at one time, these features were common throughout the far south of England, including Kent in the southeast. So a word like fox was often pronounced as vox. And a female fox was a vixen. And that Southern English word vixen, with a V, passed into Standard English. So today, we might think of a vixen as a foxy lady, but vixen is actually cognate with the word fox, and it's really just a product of this same Southern accent. So when the poet uses the word there for fair, we know that he probably spoke with that accent as well. The poet tells us that the nightingale sang a beautiful song, as if the music came from a harp or a pipe. As the nightingale sang, an owl stood on a stump nearby. The nightingale looked at the owl and found the owl disgusting. Monster, she said, away you should fly. Unwicked, Heosera, away through flow. Now, throughout the poem, the poet uses feminine pronouns for the birds, so they were both females. But the poet doesn't use the pronoun she. You might remember that the word she did not exist in Old English. It was first attested in the Peterborough Chronicle after the Norman Conquest. Given that this poet doesn't use that word, that suggests that the word she was not in common use yet in the far south of England. 
the poet continued to use the Old English feminine pronouns like ho and heo and hea. The poet also doesn't use the new Norse pronoun forms they and them and their. He still uses older English forms that begin with an H sound like he and ho and heo. As I've noted before, all of these similar H forms encouraged the adoption of alternate forms. And over the next few decades, the feminine form she and the plural forms they, them, and their all passed into standard English. But for now, this particular poet continued to use the older forms. Returning to the poem, the nightingale says that she is disgusted by the owl's ugly appearance. She says, my heart flies away and my tongue fails me when you thrust yourself upon me. I would rather spit than sing about thine full yelling or hooting. Min horta at fleeth and fault me tongue, wona thu art to me i throng. Mi lusta bet spet and thana singa, of thina fula yo yeling. We're told that the owl took the abuse and held back until it was evening, till she couldn't take it any more. The owl then lashed out at the nightingale. She says, You insult me and say things to upset me. And then the owl threatens the nightingale. The owl says, If I held you in my feet, as it happens that I could do, and you were out of your branch, you would sing another tune. If each they hold on me volta, and so hit betida that each volta, and through where ut of thino risa, thou shouldest sing an uther wisa. The nightingale responds by saying, This is why all kinds of birds hate you and drive you away and screech at you. You're ugly to look at. Both your eyes are as black as coal and broad as if they were painted with woad. Thin eyen both coal black and broad. Recht swo ho wearen e paint mid woad. Now, woad was a type of plant that was used for making certain types of dyes. It's another one of those words that experienced that vowel change we've seen before. It was wad in Old English, wald in Middle English, and woad in Modern English. Also, the passage says that the owl's eyes were black as if e paint, or painted with woad. This is actually the first recorded use of the word paint in the English language. It's one of the few French and Latin words used in the poem. By the way, the word paint is related to the words picture and pigment and depict, all of which came in later. The nightingale then says that the owl is disgusting and fouls her own nest. Meanwhile, the owl fumes and knows that the nightingale is trying to humiliate her. And nonetheless, she answered, Why not fly into the air? and show which of us both has a brighter hue and a fairer complexion. I know the less ho yaf answera, we kneel to flow and into the bearer, and say we wear a unker bow, of brichter hoa, of verer blow. The nightingale replies, No, thou hast well sharp claws that thou keeps to claw me. Thou havest talons so strong Thou wilt grab me as one does with tongs. No, thou havest well sharp claw, ne capish noch that they may claw. Thou havest cleaver sooth as strong, thou tungest that mid so doth a tongue. So in these passages, we see that the owl has basically challenged the nightingale to a battle or a physical confrontation. But the nightingale prefers to battle with words. She proposes that the two should stop insulting each other and agree to a proper debate. Though we not be of one accord, we should rather argue with fair words. Without strife and fighting, we should plead with what is relevant and right. And may each say what she will, with right sayings and with reason. Dachwe ne bo at on accorda and mech bet mid fair word. With two chest and boot fichte, played mi foch and mid richte, 
en mit hyre either wat he wil, en mit richte seye en mit skiel. The owl agrees to the request, but asks who will mediate the debate. The nightingale replies, I know well, quoth the nightingale, there is no need to talk about it further. Master Nicholas of Guildford, he is wise and careful with words. Each what well quoth the nightingale, ne derov derov bono tala. Master Nicola of Guildford, he is wees on war of warda. So we're told that Nicholas of Guildford will judge the debate. As I noted earlier, some scholars think that Nicholas was a real person, and he was the person who wrote the poem, but there's no way to know for sure. The owl then agrees that Nicholas will judge the debate, and the debate begins. The nightingale asks the owl why she does what evil creatures do. She sings by night and not by day. The nightingale says, You fly by night and not by day. That I wonder and well may, for everything that shuns right, it loveth darkness and hates light. Thu flichs a nicht en nocht a die, der of each wondery en well may, for every thing that shuneth richt, it loveth thuster en hat it licht. The nightingale then quotes a proverb attributed to King Alfred for support. She says, for King Alfred, he said and wrote, He that knows he has fouled himself is shunned and keeps to himself. I think that is what you do also, for you fly at night evermore. For Alfred King, he said and wrote, He shunneth that he no vol wot. Each waneth that thou dost also, for thou flichtest nichtest evermo. The nightingale then points out that thieves and villains also operate in the night. So in that way, the owl is like them. Now, medieval legal scholars point out that this passage is in keeping with the proper format of a legal debate at the time. It wasn't enough to make a statement or proposition. You had to support it with evidence or testimony. So you had to call a witness. In this case, the nightingale is essentially calling King Alfred as a witness by quoting his proverb. The owl then has the opportunity to respond. She presents a series of counter-arguments. She says that small birds scream and squawk at her every day, but she prefers peace and quiet and chooses to sit in her nest. The wise men say that one should not argue with fools. The owl also quotes a proverb of King Alfred in response to the nightingale. The owl says, At times I have heard tell how Alfred once said in a spell, Look to avoid any place where there is arguing and strife. Let fools chide each other, and you go your own way. And I am wise and do this also. At summa sitha herida itela who Alfred said on his spell, Look at that thou ne borrowed there, that are both and chestigare, that sotest chida and worth to go, and each am wees and do also. So the owl has presented counter evidence against the nightingale by employing her own proverb from Alfred the Great. The owl then rejects the argument that her hooting is ugly and hard to listen to. She says that her voice is confident and strong. She says, My voice is bold and not worn. It is like a great horn. And yours is like a pipe made of a small weed that is unripe. I sing better than you doest. You chatter like an Irish priest. I sing in the evening at the right time, and then again when it is bedtime, and a third time at midnight and so I prepare my song at daylight. When I see from afar the daybreak and the morning star, I do good with my throat and call men to their note. Miss Stefna is bold in nocht un arna, who is ilich un greta horna, and thin is ilich un peep, of un small world un reap. Each sing a bet than thu dest, thu chatris so doth and erish praest,
Each sing on Eva a richte Thema. On Sotho one hit his bed Thema. The three to Sitha ad middel nechte, and so each mina song ad richte. One each is so a ries vora, other dairim, other daister. Each do gold mid mina throta, an warni man to horonota. In this passage, the owl counters the nightingale's arguments that she operates in the dark by pointing out that she regulates the night by hooting at nightfall and hooting again at bedtime and hooting for a third time at midnight and finally hooting shortly before daybreak to make sure that everybody knows when the night is over and it's time to start a new day. The owl then notes that the nightingale sings all night long without stopping, which assaults everyone's ears. Even the loveliest songs grow tired after a while. So the nightingale devalues her song by never stopping. The owl then quotes another King Alfred proverb, Everything may lose its value through lack of moderation and overuse or overdeeds. Every thing may loosen his good hair mid unmetha and mid overdeda. So the owl has offered her rebuttal to the nightingale's arguments. I should note that the passages I just read include a couple of notable words. When the owl says that the nightingale chattered like an Irish priest, that's one of the first uses of the word chatter in the English language. The ultimate source of the word is unknown. But it exists today in various forms, such as chatter, chat, and chit-chat. And when the owl says that she sings at bedtime, that's the first known use of the term bedtime in the English language. Both bed and time are Old English words, but this is the first time that they're recorded together in an English document. From here, the two birds continue to exchange arguments back and forth. I don't have time to go through the whole poem. In fact, I've only covered about one-fifth of the poem here. But the birds continue to debate until the very end when they agree that Master Nicholas is waiting for them. So they agree to take their arguments to Nicholas so he can render his final judgment in their debate. The poet then concludes with the following passage. With these words forth they fared, without an army or furred. To Portsham they both had come and how they succeeded in that judgment or doom, I can no more tell, for there is no more to this spell. Mit these werde forth he ferden, al bulte herre and bulte werden, to portesham dat heo become, an who heo speda of herre doma, na can each eb na mara tela, herre nis na mara of this spela. So we don't get a final decision. We don't know who won the debate. We're simply told that there is no more to the story. And that seems like a good way to end this episode, because there's no more to this story either. Next time, we'll look at the civil war between King John and his barons. And we'll see how John's death brought an end to the debate over Magna Carta. The war also brought about another invasion from France. And that invasion consisted of both soldiers and words. The soldiers were eventually turned back, but the words stuck around. In fact, English got a fresh injection of French words after John died. So, as English literature continued to re-emerge during the 1200s, it did so with more and more French words in place of Old English words. So we'll look at those developments next time. Until then, thanks for listening to the History of English podcast. 